shall we? And um, we can we can get moving here with this. All right. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for your goodness to us, um, for your mercies that are new to us today. May we live in those mercies and in a greater uh, awareness of your presence in our lives and your provision, uh, those things that often slip our notice that we take for granted that are really from your hand. <clears throat> and so we pause for a moment and we, we take time to, to thank you for that. We ask now, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, guide us and direct us in the study of your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. <clears throat> um, Charlene, I don't know if you've had a chance to, to look at that on <clears throat> what you, you texted me about the name of the thing I've been referencing on Prime Video. And... Um, it is indeed, I, I looked it up after you had texted me about what the name was, and I just wanted to double check to make sure the name was correct. And it is uh, Before the Wrath um, is the name of the of that uh, video. Um, and so I don't know if you've had a chance to, ah, yes, you did watch it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, you, you may not agree fully with their interpretation of their their whole eschatological position, but <clears throat> I felt what really was what you would, could really glean out of it was the the parallels that are drawn uh, um, with uh, the Galilean wedding and what Jesus says very often about end times and what it's going to be like and what the heaven uh, the kingdom of God is like. So yeah. Um, I thought it was very good myself. So anyway, <clears throat> moving on, we have yesterday we <clears throat> we talked about the, the the parable of the ten virgins and really the message of um uh really the message of verse thirty six all the way to the end of chapter twenty four. The message is pretty simple. It's pretty basic, and that is be ready. <clears throat> and part of being ready is uh, obedience uh, and, and obedience to what God has called us to do. And so what we could do, and I, so I'm going to make this correlation, you know, it was Jesus um, who base, who said the, the two greatest commandments are to love God and love others. And I would submit to you that verse 36 to the end of chapter 24 is really about loving God. Um, God's love language. If you um, love me, you will obey my commandments, Jesus said in, in John. And so God's love language is, is obedience. And it's, again, it's not obedience that is generated out of obligation or fear of punishment, but it is obedience that is driven by gratitude for who God is and what he has done for us in Christ, our, our position in Christ. And that's, it's obedience driven by, I always think of it this way. Why would I not want to obey someone who has done what God has done for me? Something I was completely incapable of doing. You know, we're always um, paying back, are we not? When someone does something for us that is gracious and unexpected, we want to do something for them. It's no different. It's I think it's just on a grander scale. So with that in mind, again, I submit to you that those the last part of chapter 24 was about loving God. And then I submit to you that <clears throat> the... That chapter 25, um, 
is the the end of chapter 25 and maybe the okay so from from where we are today is about loving others so which really boils down to what Jesus says are the two greatest commandments loving god and loving others <clears throat> Here we go. For it will be like a man. For it will be. What What will be? What's, what's it? Well, I would go back to verse 36 of chapter 24 where it says, concerning that day and hour. Okay. And that goes, takes us back to verse 3 of 24, the disciples' question of what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus at this point is saying, there really will be no sign. It will be sudden. Um, it will come upon you like a thief. Uh, it, it, it is. No one knows the hour. And so it will come suddenly in God's timing. And so be ready. And part of being ready is loving God, dedicating and devoting your life to him in obedience. And then, <clears throat> for it will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his ability, which really, you know, again, <clears throat> You have to be careful not to tear down parables and, and pick parables apart too, too much because a parable is a parable. Um, and, and so <clears throat> one of the things, though, that I think we can get from this parable is the idea that God bestows on us blessings based upon ability. There are some who are more able and they receive more and so <clears throat> you have this five talents two talents and one talent according each according to his ability so it doesn't matter our ability god still gives us talents so to speak that we are to in this case invest or, or use, okay? Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded with them, and he made five talents more. So also he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, and it's been suggested that um, the intent here, and it comes from this after a long time, the intent here was that these servants would invest and grow this money, the talents that the master had given them. So after... Uh, a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. That's, again, from that, it's kind of thought that the intent was for these guys to invest these talents, to grow these, these talents, to grow this money. Because there's a settling of accounts. And he who had received the five talents came forward bringing five talents more. He doubled, all right? Saying, Master, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will, see, I will set you over much. And so <clears throat> responsibility and... and um, so he was made responsible over little. Now the master says, I'm going to make you even more responsible. 
you're going to have more responsibility now. Enter into the joy of your master. The master was pleased. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Um, re rejoice in the fact that I'm pleased with what you have done. Um, and he also, and, and he also, who had the two talents, came forward saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here, I have made two talents more. Again, doubled what he was given. And so in some sense, you could say that um, the what was accomplished by both of the first two uh, servants was equal. They both doubled what they had. It wasn't about the amount. It was about what they did with it. So again, it isn't about our abilities. It's what we do with them, what we have. Um, and I think sometimes there are those that say, well, I don't have the abilities that that, that person has. So, you know, I, 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 they, they kind of use that as an opportunity to kind of sit back and not do anything. You know, it, it, those people with more abilities, they're the ones that are, are doing. Um, and that's not, doesn't seem to be what Jesus, the point Jesus is making here. Uh, verse 23, his master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. The same thing that he said to the first servant. He's saying to this servant, enter into your master's or uh, enter into the joy of your master. Again, so it's not about the amount. It's about what we do with it. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. So the picture of this master is that... Um, this one servant felt like his master was kind of, in some ways, ruthless and and greedy, and um, where he says, "Reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed." So I was afraid, and I went and I hid your talent in the ground here. You have what is yours. I've done nothing with what you've given me other than I protected it. I put it in the ground and, and I'm giving it back to you. I've done nothing with it. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. You knew that I reap where I've not sown and gather where I've scattered no seed. You knew that about me? Seems as though maybe this servant didn't really know his master. And then the master says, if that's really what you thought about me, if that's really who you thought I was, then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I should have received what was my own with interest. I mean, if you want to protect my money, don't bury it in the ground, <clears throat> but at least invest it so that there's some interest, which wouldn't have taken much effort on this servant's part. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the 10 talents. Notice here that um, the master doesn't take the talents back. He doesn't take the five and the, the other five that was earned. That's the much then that must be the much, much that the master puts the servant in charge of. You've earned five. All right, here you go. Here's 10. I'll put you in charge of much. For to everyone who has will more be given. Ah, look, I've made five from the five you gave me. Okay, here's 10. And he will have an abundance, but from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. 
and cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness in that place where, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so, <clears throat> um, I got a little overzealous in what I was saying. I think here you still have love God. Um, and, um, it's about this. It's the same theme. It's, it's about obedience. Um, it's, it, it's about, um, commitment and dedication and obedience to the father or here in this parable, the master. Now we can turn a corner, all right? <laughs> when, <clears throat> verse 31, the Son of Man comes in his glory. Okay, now Jesus is saying, okay, when when that day comes, the day of, of my coming, the end of the age, when that day comes, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Is it possible that Jesus is talking about the great white throne judgment here? Um, yeah, it's very possible that he's talking about the great white throne judgment. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And this is where now we begin to think, oh, this is just another parable. It's not a parable. Uh, it's it's a it, it's like um, a simile, so to speak. Um, but it's basically using the illustration of sheep and and goats as what will happen at the final judgment. This is really um, Jesus talking about that final judgment. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. So sheep <clears throat> more prized in that culture than goats. And so um, sheep and goats would often be in the same flock. And so <clears throat> when it came time to perhaps uh, sell or, or do something with that flock, the sheep would get separated from the goats. And then this idea of, and again, it's, it's a cultural thing, and he will place the sheep on his right. The right was a place of honor. The goats on the left, the left was a place of dishonor. So right-handed, left-handed kind of thing. Then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So <clears throat> the right being blessed come into the kingdom, which has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked or and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers. Remember that least of these? Those who will be great in the kingdom will be the least. You did it to me. It seems to me what Jesus is talking about here is that he's talking about loving others. That love God, love others. And, and Jesus does make the point that we will be judged based upon our fruit. But... Our fruit, you go to John 15, our fruit is the result of abiding in Christ. The fruit is not something that we produce out of our own will. Fruit is produced when we are 
abiding in Christ. It is the natural outcome of abiding. So we have to be careful. What Jesus isn't saying here, I don't. He is not saying that this is about works. Uh, that we're saved based upon our works. No, the 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 loving of our fellow brothers, the loving of our fellow human beings, the loving of others, as Jesus talks about in the second great commandment, is a natural outcome. <clears throat> natural outcome of loving God, abiding in Christ, that I would equate with loving God. And the natural outcome then is loving others. And even though we are judged on our fruit, the fruit is really produced by God's grace, by simply abiding in Christ. Verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, place of dishonor, the goats, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. That eternal fire was prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus doesn't say it was prepared for those on his left. I think this goes again to, um, is it Peter where it says that God desires that all should come to repentance? Um, that is God's desire, but there's going to be those who, who don't come to repentance. And so they will share the same fate as the devil and his angels. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me naked and you did not clothe me sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they will say, then they will, then they also will answer saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it, to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The righteous being those who are in right relationship with God. I believe it's more about that than it is about the behavior. And again, um, This is, there's no fruit in these people's lives. And because there's no fruit, it's evident that they are not abiding in Christ. They, they are not in Christ. And so, because they are not in Christ, their destiny is eternal punishment. <clears throat> If we were to make this section of scripture out about um, the final judgment being on works, that would run contrary to the gospel itself. It would run contrary to everything that Paul wrote about the gospel, that um, the righteous, uh, uh, we are made righteous by faith and faith alone, not by works. Um and so, <clears throat> in light of that, and in light of the gospel itself, that's why I go here and I say this has to be about people who are in Christ and abiding in him and fruit being produced in their lives versus those who are not in Christ, not abiding in him, and so there is no fruit. Um, and that fruit that Jesus talks about seems to, to be the love of others. The least of these, as Jesus puts it. So, not a parable, but a picture of the final judgment and a picture of what that judgment will be based upon. So this, this whole deal here, um, when Jesus talks about his coming and uh, the 
his second coming, the end of the age, seems to be no one knows the hour, so be ready. And, and the way that you are ready is to love God through your obedience to him and love others through your service to them. The fruit that is produced in our lives when we abide in Christ. There you are. Um, let me pray and I will uh, let you get about your day. Father God, thank you again for uh, your word and for your spirit who gives us insight into it. Father, we ask um, as we meditate and we think on uh, what uh, these parables and what Jesus talks about in terms of the final judgment, we, um, we ask that you would help us to stay connected to the vine, to abide in Christ, that the fruit in our life would be fruit um, that is consistent with eternal life that our love for you and our love for others would be evident in our lives. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. All right. Hey, thank you for, again, joining in each day as you do, you faithfully do. Um, we're back at it tomorrow. Tomorrow's Thursday already. So much to do before, uh, you know, I just appreciate um, prayer uh, this uh, weekend. Um, Saturday, we have a deacon elder retreat. So uh, we're going to be um, looking at uh, taking a further look at our mission statement with our three rhythms, which I would consider our three rhythms, three key result areas. In other words, if we're going to accomplish our mission, we need to have results in these areas. And so we're going to be looking at um, writing some goals uh, for us as a church for the next six to 12 months. Um, goals that are in uh, those areas and um, as a way to, to be better at those rhythms and not just talk about them, but actually put them into practice. And so anyway, pray for us as we do that, um, as we seek to guide and, and lead uh, the, the body of Olympic view. So with that being said, um, Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow um, and we will pick up chapter 26, which is a shift. We're now done with this pl public or private kind of session with the disciples. And it, it is now the, the movement for the next um, couple chapters here is a movement to the cross. Jesus' arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and then ultimately his resurrection. And so we've got basically just two more chapters left in Matthew. So got to start figuring out where we're going to go next with this. So anyway, um, I'll stop droning on. With that, God bless. Uh, be well. Be safe. Hopefully see you tomorrow.